Hello, everyone, and welcome back. Today, we're going to talk about Season 2, Episode 1 of Psych. Um, if you're enjoying the show, please remember to give us a like or subscribe or share it with people that you think might be interested. Uh, thank you for sticking around and uh, coming back for Season 2. We're super excited. Uh, so, Barb, is there anything new going on? Well, first, we hope that everyone was able to listen to our interview with Sage Brocklebank, a.k.a. Buzz McNabb. I loved the insider info that he gave us, and we hope you enjoyed that as well. And hopefully we'll have some more interviews in the future, you know, with, with some other cast members or maybe even Sage again one day. Who knows? So, yeah, that'd be awesome. I'll, yeah. Also, check out our Facebook group if you have not already done that. We do have a specific group uh, that we know you know a podcast about Psych Facebook group. So check that out if you haven't already. Yeah, there's links in the description, so you don't have to right. type it in and search it. So, Matthew, this might, season two, this might be collectively my favorite season in terms of how many five pineapple rating episodes there are for me in season two. Yeah, I did skim through the titles on IMDb just to see the the lineup, and it mm -hmm. is pristine. Um, yeah. I think, you know, just... I'm not going to give official ratings until we actually watch them and review them on the air, but I'm thinking there's easily going to be at least four five stars. I, I, I think yeah, so. probably more for me. I, I but, think so. I mean, it, there are a lot of episodes episodes in this season that are like just mm -hmm. gold. I mean, yeah. they're just psych gold so i'm super excited that we're in say, uh, season two but this is very exciting we don't want to get too far ahead of ourselves no, right no, now we're no, on episode no. one only episode yes. one barb okay. we're only on episode one um american <laughs> it's, duos it's very right. hard not to get ahead <laughs> this episode is titled american duos it aired on july 13th in 2007 it was written by steve franks James Rode Rodriguez and Andy Berman, as well as being directed by John Landis. Andy Berman, we remember from He Loves Me, He Loves Me Not, the the speed dating episode. He was actually acting in that episode as well as co-writing. And we all, of course, are excited that James Rode Rodriguez is writing at this point more episodes. So uh, we know there's going to be some more funny in it from just that alone. But um, John Landis also directed the last episode that we talked about, Scary Sherry, Bianca's Toast. And he will also epi uh, direct another episode later called Christmas Joy. So he did three episodes of Psych altogether, but we did and talk about him a lot last time. Good ones. Like, yeah. They're oh, all, yeah. They're all good episodes. I mean, honestly, the first one was probably the one that was the lowest reviewed. Yeah. But... Um, Scary Sherry was a hit. We got lots of five star reviews from that one from mm -hmm. our guest reviews. And uh, even you and I loved it too. So, and Christmas Joy, I know, is a, in the future is a, is a good one too. Yeah. We, and it's no surprise. I mean, like this guy directed Coming to America and Beverly Hills Cop 3 and Three Amigos and like all these really, really funny. Yeah. He gets the movies. characters. He gets it. Yeah. yeah. He and he also dude, gets he comedy. Him. He mm. really gets comedy. So, yeah, definitely. Um, so this episode, the synopsis uh, for American Duos is one of Gus's favorite singing competition shows, American Duos, is filming in Santa Barbara, and someone is trying to kill one of the judges. The chief calls the psych team in to protect the judge. To gain backstage access, they become contestants and solve the case as they work their way onto the show. Yeah. I, uh, there's good reason why someone wants to kill one of the judges. That's all I'll say. <laughs> <Yes>. <laughs> Absolutely. <laughs> all right. So let's, uh, let's just jump into the breakdown. And, yeah. They took Simon yeah. Cowell to a whole new level. <laughs> yeah. Mm -hmm. They had a lot, they had fun with it. They, they, it was good, especially yeah, the ending. I, I really enjoyed how it ended too. So <laughs> yes. yeah. Uh, so yeah, this week we open up with Sean and Gus about to do a talent show, uh, presumably for school. Uh, we have Gus in full Michael Jackson garb, um, like thriller outfit, the red jacket, red pants on, and a <laughs> wig. They've they went all out. They got a wig, and it looked like a pretty good wig too. But uh, he, so, and Sean is dressed as Roland or Zabel or Zabel, Sable, the drummer from Tears Tears for Fears, and his hair is also 
a wig and they're both they both look exactly like the people that i had to google because i didn't know who uh you know roland or zabel was but they it's on point they did a great job i can't i can't okay it's difficult It's the, a difficult the best part, episode though. to talk about because unless you see what they're what they are dressed like, it is so hard to put into words how cute they look. And can mm-hmm. I just, as a side note, add yay for different Gus Junior? <laughs> yes, that was part of my notes. Yeah, that's different the first time. Gus. It's our first instance of the young Gus that you and I both love, Carlos. This is Carlos the second. Yes. yes. This is my favorite young Gus. And so I was so happy to see that on this episode. But man, they are so cute dressed like this. And I love like Sean's like, what are you dressed like this for? You should. (laughs) Supposed to be Billy Ocean. (laughs) I had to look up Billy Ocean, too. But yes. Yeah. And um, yeah, Sean, part of what makes the scene so funny is that Sean is not only dressed up and that's funny, but Sean is also very serious about this. He is. He's like, I he hope is. the judges don't slam us for this. Why would Michael Jackson be singing with uh, Roland or Zabel? And yeah, so yeah, he was really serious. And Gus seemed like he was not worried about it at all. He no. didn't really seem to care. So it seems mm-hmm. like one of those things that Sean probably pushed him into. But... He was so happy with his costume choice, mm-hmm. but he didn't. He didn't care. <laughs> And then, and then, wait, okay, wait a minute. Doesn't he say though that he doesn't know how to moonwalk? Well, he's like, uh, he's like, we're gonna have to find some way to add the moonwalk to shout. And uh, Gus is like, <laughs> I don't know how to moonwalk. He's like, you better learn fast. And then they walked out on stage. <laughs> it's fantastic. I love that. <laughs> so good. Okay. So yeah. But God, they have such good chemistry together. I love these two together as young Sean and Gus. Yes. Uh, they they seem like really good friends. So <laughs> after the talent show, we go to the psych office where the guys are watching American duos. You can clearly, <laughs> clearly see. Well, I had a couple notes about this. First of all, the people on the show are singing She'll Be Coming Around the Mountain. Who? It's like crunk. Is, <laughs> who is going to, <laughs> who's going to sing that at a talent audition? For a television show. I mean, I don't know. The only thing I can think of is maybe they didn't want to buy the rights for any more songs in this episode. Because they had <laughs> a lot of them. They, and true, they had actually. to just use something that, you know, that's the only thing I can think of. Because I was like, why in this world are they showing them singing She'll Be Coming Around the Mountain? Mm-hmm. And like acting like they're so into it. It was that was that was kind of. I, I don't know. Very weird. But you can see, though, that out of the two of them, Gus is very, very into this show. And Sean is clearly not. Mm-hmm. Well, uh, part of this is we get to see through the TV that they're watching the judges. Uh, we have Tim Curry as our special guest star, and he's playing as a Nigel St. Nigel, the <laughs> hardcore like Simon Cowell type on the show that's just brutally honest and is very cynical. And he plays it very well. Um, uh, it, it, we get to see more of it throughout the episode, but... He definitely does a great job playing that character. He's just got it on point. Um, I found an interesting fact on IMDb that David Bowie was originally considered for the part of Nigel. David, that would be David Bowie. Yes, that's right. That would be David <laughs> Bowie. <laughs> David Bowie. I mean, I just thought that he, you know, floated really easily, but um, that, <laughs> <laughs> the, uh... David, da- David <laughs> Bowie was extremely famous, Matt. <laughs> I don't no, understand. Jesus, I just don't know. Even at your I've age, heard the name you before. don't know who David Bowie is. But okay, um, right, we're just going to try and move past that while I. Well, I thought another wonder. interesting thing was apparently. So, if you listened to the interview that we have with Sage, you'll have you'll know that uh, the names of these characters are not always picked out from the very beginning. Right. Um, sometimes they just are handed to you on a name tag randomly. Mm-hmm. Um. But in this case, uh, Tim Curry, whenever he got the role, they named him Nigel based off of uh, his voice acting for an animated series called The Wild Thornberries. And he played this, like a uh, Australian guy on there that had like the same accent. He, he sounds exactly the same. I didn't even know it was him, but I used to watch that show when a kid. And yeah, that's where I know it from, uh, The Wild Thornberries. And he played the guy on there named Nigel. 
Uh, so I thought that was an interesting fact for people who know that show. So in this scene, there's an interesting spot where they're they're watching it. Gus is, or I'm sorry, Sean is bored out of his mind. Gus is really into it. He's laughing and giggling and all that stuff. And <laughs> Sean tries to answer the phone, and uh, Gus very quickly like grabs his arm whenever he goes up to reach back to grab the phone, and he's like, "Rule number one, Sean: no talking during duos." <laughs> which Gus is serious and I he does this also in the future like this is one of his quirks is that when he's into something he doesn't want to be disturbed while he's doing it I, I totally can imagine it. who that reminds me of oh yeah <laughs> mm. Matthew's very much like that yes very much I totally get it but uh yeah so yeah. in that scene um Sean also tells Gus don't be a rabid porcupine which <laughs> that I I thought was great um, uh, cause that is just, I don't know. That's a thing that they do that it's, it's starting now. I think that's like the, is that the first time? Is that a first here already? Gus, don't I think be, he uh, might have done it once in season one, but it wasn't something so major. Like now he's going to start doing it more. This is going to yeah. be, this is going to be more of a, there's a lot of that bit. in this yeah. episode. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Don't be a rabid porcupine. Um, yep. Okay, so then at about five minutes and one second, we are at the station. We're in Chief Vic's office. We meet Nigel St. Nigel and learn someone is trying to kill him. So he, um, you know, he wants like psychic protection so that somebody can see what's about to happen beforehand and make sure he doesn't get killed. And so the chief, of course, calls in Sean and Gus to protect him. And I loved in this scene, first of all, Nigel is like, no. And then, you know, he finally, Chief Vic is pretty stern with him. And he ends up, you know, accepting their help. But he only wants the people in the room. So that would be Chief Vic and Jules and Sean and Gus to know what's going on. And they say, you know, Sean's like, what about Lassie? And he looks at him and says, (laughs) no. He can't know because it looks like his hair was poured out of a cake mold. <laughs> yep. That is a another one of those very accurate descriptions. <laughs> I'm surprised you didn't say like Lego hair. <laughs> yeah. But yeah, anyway, that was funny. But um, there were a few other things that happened in this scene that I, I particularly loved. So okay. this was where we first get to really see Nigel. It's still the beginning. Of that. We're only like three minutes in. but. Um, this is where like it really stands out. Like he nails it in his screen time here. Like the confidence mixed with the pretentiousness, uh, and then like the eye rolling and the like, the change of his tone. He kills it as this character. He well, does and the really lack good job. of regard for emotions, <laughs> right? Like he has clearly there's no filter. There's no concern for how someone's going to feel when he says what he says. He doesn't yeah. care. Oh, yeah, he definitely doesn't care because Gus, the first thing Gus says when he sees him is like, you were super rude to like Stacy in season two. And he's like, I don't remember the person to whom you're referring, but she was hideous. (laughs) (laughs) Just immediate. And and Sean, this whole time, is like reacting to this pretentiousness. Uh And it's really, it's his face is kind of funny throughout this, but. Um, Sean does try to give some of his flair and grandeur whenever he talks to him, mm-hmm. and he just shuts it down. He doesn't want anybody. He, he's like he doesn't want the theatrics that yeah. Sean is used to, and Sean is very weird about it. He's like he doesn't know what to say. Right, it, it's almost he like that. he's like, how am I going to sell this if I can't be that way? Exactly. Mm-hmm. Right. And then he right. also I made it notice that he uh, he tells Juliet to stop slouching. Whenever mm-hmm. she like she talks to him and he's like, and stop slouching. <laughs> Just so, really critiquing everyone. Okay, so we probably should go back and take a quick look at, you know, when we, when they were filming the show and we met all the judges. So there was Nigel St. Nigel and then there was Amelia I'm, I'm not I'm saying her name wrong. Is that it? Amelia Saffron? Uh Emelina. 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 Mm-hmm. Um Emelina Saffron and Zapato. Who looks high. Emelina, not Zapato. Oh, yeah. <laughs> Zapato. And it makes me laugh that they um, chose that name for him. Because if I'm not mistaken, Zapato in Spanish is shoes. Something like that, yeah. Zapatos or shoes. which I So I think that's a funny name for him. Anyway, I think it was that, like fancy shoes or something. 
Zapatos? Like his, his first and last name. No, his last name is something. Oh, oh, oh. I saw something about it when I was looking up information on the episode. Yeah, it was it's something about was like funny. fancy feet or fancy shoes or something. Yeah. Well, anyway, so Emelina, I, her character, <laughs> I, I'm guessing that this was really supposed to be someone like based off Paula Abdul. Mm -hmm. but, but I don't know. Um, I'm just going to loosely say that. But she was just a hot mess through this episode. So yeah. I think all the judges clearly had their place and, and, you know, but Nigel was, he was the mean one for sure. And you yeah. get to see that a lot in the office. And like you're saying, like the, the character there comes out for sure. But the guys were super excited that they got put on an undercover case. Both of them, not just Sean, but both of them were actually really excited. Mm -hmm. And Sean already knew what their cover was going to be. <laughs> mm. Because it immediately cuts to in like on the show, and uh -huh. it's like our next contestants are, and then it's Sean, Sean Spencer Star and Gus TT Showbiz. The second T is for talent. <laughs> or the extra T is for extra talent. That's what it was. I love that. But uh, yes, uh, there was one thing I was curious about. I did try to look it up, and I I couldn't really find anything in it. But uh, their contestant numbers were four three one zero five. And I wasn't sure if that had any significance. Um, no, I, I so. couldn't find anything on it, but I, I don't know. I was wondering if that was maybe an Easter egg. I don't know if maybe one of the psychos out there knows if there's any significance to those numbers. Mm -hmm. But I couldn't find one. Nothing but to again, my knowledge. I feel like I wouldn't mm -hmm. be doing my job if I didn't at least check. Yeah. So, okay. So, Sean Spenstar and Gus TT Showbiz start singing Take On Me. Uh-huh. <laughs> their rendition and like even emelina knows that they're not even singing the same verse mm -hmm. which if she's noticing it it must be really obvious and uh they pretty much butcher the song um but they really were feeling it like you could you could see particularly gus he was feeling it oh yeah gus it, was trying yeah gus was trying. they were into it but it wasn't good and the look of Jules, like Jules was backstage watching this, and she was like getting ready to vomit, like she was so so sickened by this performance. One was... thing I caught was the Ryan Crest guy, the the Ryan Seacrest Ryan character, quote unquote, the, host the uh, of the show, yeah, yeah. The, the, host, the host, yeah, yeah, the host yeah. of it. He uh -huh. walks up afterwards, like with the microphone, <laughs> and he's like, "Really?" <laughs> like looking at them yeah, because Nigel is like, it was brilliant, <laughs> it was genius, it was so good. And there he's like, what? <laughs> and the other two judges are going, no. And then yeah. he speaks for Zapato. And he's like, no, Zapato says yes. Nigel does. Zapato says yes. And they, you know. Zapato so they didn't advance. say anything. Like, yeah, well, he Every time he went speak. to talk. Yeah, every time he went to talk, he cut him off. Yeah. Well, mm. they got through. <laughs> they got through round one. Uh, yes, that is actually something that I thought was really funny was this little scene because Emelina comes in to like kick him off. She's trying to be nice about it, but she is like, guys, I don't have to tell you, but that, that was just bad. But she makes this one line and it, it really cracked me up. I, I watched it twice and it was like, um, I love that you guys both chose to wear purple. And <laughs> <laughs> this is hilarious because... We're looking at her, but to the left on the table is a screen that's showing what the audience sees, which is Sean and Gus. And you can see on that screen, when she says that, Sean and Gus both look down <laughs> to like inspect their outfits. And then they look at each other's outfits. And then they look at each other. And they're confused. <laughs> And she is. She's holding her shoe too. Like she's she's got her shoe. She's like bending it, holding it, and then she sticks her foot up on the desk and like puts her shoe on. And she starts a sentence and just stops midway through. Like doesn't even finish the sentence. And everyone's looking at her like, like what? Finish your thought. She could not even do it. She really. So this girl confused. is. It's it's just too much. And Jules is in the background, and she's like hiding her eyes even like she she has not only oh, tried to fake vomit she is like hiding her eyes like i can't watch anymore uh, it was that was a great scene sean was so confused he was <laughs> like <laughs> what 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 because <laughs> nobody was wearing purple 
except Zapato. But you know, she wasn't even <laughs> she looking was in his a direction. Lot of purple. But she wasn't even looking in his direction. Zapato I mean, didn't even girl, exist, essentially. Ooh, she's a hot, hot. Oh mess. my god, that was so funny. Well, after the, are you but, okay? <laughs> um, uh, yeah. Well, no, no, because right after that scene, after Nigel pushes him through to the next stage of the competition, mm -hmm. um, I there was a scene where Lester, the the Ryan Seacrest duplicate, the the host, mm -hmm. um, he mentions, "Are you sure about this? You all know it happened to that Indian guy from that other show." And then I had to look it up because I know they're referencing American Idol. Yes. And when we looked it up, it was uh, the every like, all the things I came up with was Sanjaya Mal Malakar uh -huh. uh, uh -huh. from American Idol, and he wasn't very good, but they kept pushing him through. And I looked up one of his videos just to like see what it was exactly. <laughs> and yeah, I t I totally see it. Just you know, just eh, just like he, karaoke. He was bad. I yeah. watched that season. It's like a karaoke it bar. Good. It was it was yeah. not that great. There's nothing special. But no. um, I did also want to say that uh, I think we actually, I think you saw this as well. Um, the Lester, the guy who plays Lester mm -hmm. was also the actor in He Loves Me, He Loves Me Not, Oops, He's Dead, that that episode. Yeah. Um, he was one of the, one of the naked found. guys that was found in the, the middle of the field. Uh, mm -hmm. He was actually, he was the funny one too, the active one. Um, so, yeah. Mm -hmm. I, I never noticed that before. Yeah. I think it's because I didn't watch the first season that much because it wasn't my favorite season. But yeah, never noticed it. After they do their performance and they get judged and moved on, they're, we're at about nine minutes now. They're talking to Jules about their next performance. And they're so serious. And she says, what are you going to do? You guys need to like do something, uh, you know, more. And he says, we're going to sing... Yankee Rose by David Lee Roth, and Gus will sing the guitar part. Yeah, Gus can <laughs> sing the guitar part. <laughs> he was really, really adamant about that, and Gus was fine. He was like all in with that. He was all in. Well, so one other we, thing we should point out, though, is that uh -huh. um, right after they were pushed through and accepted, and Nigel approved them, a a giant filming light fell from the ceiling and landed on the table in front of Nigel St. Nigel. He almost yes. died there. That was yes. the first attempt on screen at his life. Which, you know, it happens. You know, he wasn't happy. He was times. ready to stop production yeah. and everything else. So, mm -hmm. And Lester pretty quickly was like, no, we're not stopping production. Essentially, like, we, we're not. We, we had to keep going. Could have been any of us there. So they're they're talking about suspects and you know these they're like walking through the hallways and everything and Sean is saying we're just going to have to talk to everyone and Gus says well this is not going to be easy I think I'm developing a pop <laughs> they've only <laughs> sang one song yeah the way he <laughs> says it too really sells it like it it might not be the same with us saying it but yeah he's he's very serious about it mm -hmm. It's only been one song. It's the equivalent of somebody going to the gym and being like, oh, I think I'm getting too big already. Like, yeah. <laughs> they go to the gym one okay. time and like, yeah, I can feel it. It's coming in real quick. <laughs> yes. It like reminded me of Pitch Perfect when she had nodes, you know, and which is essentially the same thing. But it, it yeah, it was that was funny. I mean, like he is not saying enough to develop polyps, but whatever. But that's when they meet. <laughs> that's when they meet a couple of the other contestants. Well, the first one they run into is uh, they they actually hear his voice, uh, Bevan Rennie Llewellyn, and um, he has a great voice, but he ditched his partner for the show American Duos, and that is his hook. That he, he he's like that that that's it. You know, everybody's got to have their thing. So good luck with that. But uh, after their little interaction, Sean is like, oh, he did it. Yeah, he definitely did it. <laughs> and then. Yeah. <laughs> they bump into then like two people come out the door and they just got passed through. They just went on. And uh, one of them is played by Ben Cotton. And he He's is also another a duplicate. duplicate. Mm -hmm. He was on season yes. one, episode four. Um, and I didn't think about it until I read this because I didn't like that episode that much. But mm -hmm. uh, he was one of the convicts that got out. Um, mm -hmm. It was in the scene where Sean was like reading the guy's hands from bouncing off the mirror and the pot and then the TV. Um, At the so, hotel yeah. or the motel, yeah. Fun fact, this guy I know from Stargate Atlantis. If any of you guys watch that show, he was this really annoying doctor on that show. 
and uh, many yeah. hallmark features and other things that film in vancouver mm -hmm. so but um yeah. i do also want to mention that i thought it was really funny that his uh he has his brother so in the show ben cotton's character's name is chance and his brother's name is rance so <laughs> chance and rance both got passed through on american idol or american duos and um <laughs> The way that he said it with his like country accent was great. He's like, "Yeah, Nigel said we were a curious cocktail of inbreeding and type two diabetes." <laughs> and then he says, and "Then Gus is our trauma is like, wow, well, it's really hit below the belt." <laughs> He's like, "Yeah, Australian people are mean, <laughs> but they pass us through anyways." <laughs> <laughs> he did such a good job with the accent. Well, but oh, then I when then when they went away, Sean was like, "They did it." <laughs> oh yeah, because Rance is super them. creepy. Rance, Rance has a really creepy, creepy vibe. Very quiet. He just stares at you. Yeah, very very, very creepy very vibe. Creepy. So yeah, he's like, "Never mind, they did it." <laughs> yeah, yeah. So Sean's clearly he doesn't know yet what's happening. Like he, mm -hmm. there's no resolution in his mind. Oh, Usually God. he catches on kind of early to like what direction to sort of go to, and in this episode, I think it like took him a little bit longer. The, that's which was kind of cool because yeah. it wasn't a very obvious thing that was going on from the beginning, at least from yeah. what they showed us. So. You know, right. So after that incident where, you know, the camera thing fell and Nigel got mm -hmm. out of the way, um, they went to uh, talk to him about some of the people they talked to. So they went to his trailer to talk to Nigel. And whenever they're in that interaction, Sean catches him and saves him again because somebody put a like essentially turned a hose on outside and dropped in a like electrical, like a, a cable into it. Mm hmm. Let's so anybody learn. who stepped there would have died, which is really risky because you have yeah. no control over that scenario. Anybody could have just stepped in there. But mm -hmm. um, yeah, so Sean sees it before uh, Nigel steps in it and he's able to keep him. So that's the second attempt in this one episode on his life. And yeah. luckily, Sean was there. And Sean saved mm -hmm. the day. All right. So at 1135... Sean is there, like they're they're up in the like rafters, like kind of trying to get the idea of where this light could have dropped from. How easy would it have been to get up there? All of that. So they, you know, Sean and Gus are up there in the in the rafters, and they're watching some of the other contestants perform on the stage, and they're dancing. And Sean notices Jules in back of them, like. She's moving with them. She's like trying. Well, let me say she's trying not to move with them. She's holding back a little bit, but you can see she really wants to dance. So that gives him an idea. Like maybe Jules could help them a little bit. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah. With their choreography. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Uh, but after the incident with the electricity, uh, a second attempt on his life, they uh, Lassiter decided to bring everybody who could could possibly be involved in this down to the station to interrogate him. And mm -hmm. lo and behold, because he was never involved in this, he didn't know they were undercover. Um, he comes walking into the interrogation and he has Buzz with him. We got McNabb in this episode. Mm -hmm. And he sits down and he looks up and it's them. Sean and Gus, they're just staring with happy smiles on their faces just because they have a chance to mess with Lassie. So Lassie first asks, what are you guys doing down there? <laughs> and Gus is like, we're looking for our big break. <laughs> 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 and then he's like all right i don't have time for this you guys get out of here and then sean, sean says aren't you gonna ask us if we did it and then gus jumps in ask him i plead the fifth <laughs> and sean <laughs> is shocked <laughs> and he looks over like wasn't expecting it it was just another funny little scene because gus had this little smirk on his face the whole time so once they leave the interrogation room, that's when they find Juliet. And Sean asks her to help oh. them. Like, he's like, you know, help us. And she is like, no, I'm not going to help. I don't, I don't want to do this. And pretty much sends them on their way. 
Um, she says, what does she say? She says, I don't like what you have it. I think is your uh, I don't like the liars. Uh, oh yeah. Cause she was talking about how she got kicked out of cheer camp. Like she's like, I spent two weeks in cheer camp before I got kicked out. And then they're like, what? And she's like, you know, it's safe to say, I don't like liars that steal nail polish, then pass out after you slap them around a little bit on the back of the head. <laughs> <laughs> Super aggressive. Jules, Jules was rough at cheer camp. Just I mean, slapping him around a little bit. <laughs> yeah. Until I they mean, pass come out. On. Well, I mean, but the cool oh, part geez. is finally she agreed. Like they were walking out, and she's like, "Wait, guys." So we're gonna see how that goes later. Um, yeah. But we're back at the hotel with Nigel. Um, they've walked through the hallway, and and Sean has seen a couple of food trays from room service sitting outside and he notices the little toothpicks in the sandwich that have the sword thing yeah. on them. And so they go back into Nigel's room where he has a standing order for lunch and Sean stops him from eating the sandwich because what he notices is that the toothpicks are different in it. So he knows something's up with this food and he stops him. So this, my favorite part of this scene though, is where um, Sean, he's, he's, takes the sandwich from Nigel and Nigel says, give it back. And Sean goes, no. <laughs> like he, doesn't like, he talks like him. No. No. And he does it like an Australian accent. Yeah. yeah. Which, which was great. But once mm -hmm. again, he saved him. Again, yeah. Nigel is really going to owe Sean at the end of this, but he'll never acknowledge that. Uh, they, they, after Sean does the poison sandwich, uh, we're about 18 minutes, 20 seconds in. Um, we are back at the police station. They test the sandwich. They find out that it is just laced with drugs, uh, like a mm -hmm. bunch of horse tranquilizers and stuff like that. Um, so they called it. They got the points for that with Nigel for saving him. Uh, that was the third attempt on his life so far. And before their leave, Lasseter calls out to him, and he, and he tells him that, he said, uh, you missed one. And they're like, what? And they're like, Spencer, we found a prince. <laughs> and like... Boom, on point. Sean was like, was he in a little red cap Corvette? And then Gus, <laughs> under the cherry moon? <laughs> Another great scene that shows their chemistry. They just bounce off of each other so so well. Absolutely. I would love it if that scene was completely improv but I think that would be too good to be true. <laughs> in I reality. think that may have just been one that instead of improv James Roday was probably like, here we go. Mm-hmm. You know, Possibly. when he wrote it, because if he helped write this episode, so mm -hmm. could have been. I mean, I, you'd like to think that. But um, I it also should be mentioned that um, before when they were doing the interrogations of like all the cast and crew and everybody there, um, uh, Lasseter was interrogating uh, Zabato and he was he had no idea who he was. Mm -hmm. He's like, wait, you're on the show. I, I, I've seen it. I've seen the show before. And I don't remember you on there like he had no idea who he was. Which is a funny little awkward moment for Zapato, but uh, and then, and then Emmeline, 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 Emmelina, Emmelina. Mm -hmm. uh, whenever they did the searching, they found in her purse or her bag all the drugs, like a bunch of mm -hmm. prescriptions that were expired, that were old ones, and then her new ones, and it was the drugs that were used to poison his sandwich. So she is now, um, she's in the interrogation room, but she's out. Yes. She's out, yeah. like. She wakes up and mm -hmm. is like freaking out. She's wanting her bag. I need my bag. I have to have my bag. And mm -hmm. you know, she's really freaking out about that. And Lassiter, when he <laughs> when she notices, like comes out of the haze a little bit from getting up, she looks at him and she calls him Mr. Bean. <laughs> and then calls him Tony Randall. Yeah, later like, on. All in the same scene. All uh -huh. in the same scene. She she's Mr. Mr. Bean and Tony Randall. See, I love this part because after that scene, he's like, all right, well, I'm gonna leave you to think about it. And he walks out and goes into the other side where you can see through the mirror, the two-way glass, and the chief is in there. And he thinks that she's just pretending to be crazy to get out of it. And he's like, Don't worry, Chief. I'm gonna crack her like a bad back. <laughs> And then and the chief like, gives him this weird little look for a minute. And she's like, please don't. <laughs> Which, by the way, can I say the chief this episode was awesome. 
such a cute yeah character. she was great, great in this episode yeah. like she was like tough but like knowledgeable yeah like, she i like the interactions between her and lassiter because there's this weird thing where you don't always notice lassiter's extremeness or like right hyper focusness but almost to mm-hmm. the absurd until he's paired with somebody who is normal right like the chief so like right. the chief is so she's like please don't like yeah. makes him feel dumb <laughs> Or makes him at oh. least go, oh, was that too much? You know? A little too like much that, energy. Yeah. Too much energy. Okay. Um, okay. So at two minutes, 20 seconds, this was something really cool in this episode. They show us the psych office and the wording is green. Yes. That is actually a great point. I saw it, but I, I did not write it down. Oh, I was so happy. I was like, yes, another reason Green to like season two. Green letters on the psych office now. Yeah, we got rid of that like, blue it's crap about time. that was not right. That's right. And then you look into the window, and here we are at Jules teaching them dance lessons. They are using the song Shout by Tears for Fears, and this scene is, like, I had to rewatch it <laughs> a couple of times. Because it is beautiful. This scene is just so funny. So she is she is talking to them. Um, in my I I love when she's like, <laughs> she says that they're not focused. You have to want it. <laughs> Hold on, she goes. <laughs> I can't. Okay, so they're dancing. They're dancing. The guys in back sort of stop dancing after she sort of she, she goes a little wild for a second, and they stop. And she looks at it like they're not trying. They're not doing anything. So she turns around and she's hardcore, and she's like, "I can teach you to crump." <laughs> she's she like uses her hands like at her eyes. Watch me, she says it. So funny. She like tells them, you got to want this. You got to dig deep. You got to, like, she's giving this. Motivational. Speech. And um, yeah. Speech, yeah. And, and they, they were like, okay, like, okay. Mm-hmm. And then they start dancing again. But that was a great scene. That scene made me laugh so hard. I had to rewatch. Love when that happens. After the Juliet Dance Academy scene. Uh, we're about 22 minutes, 48 seconds in, and we're back with Nigel at his uh, hotel. And McNabb is coming in and dropping off some awful, like, it, it was like ramen noodles, noodles I think. Mm-hmm. Yeah, it was ramen noodles and like like a pastry or something. And uh, we can tell that Nigel is thrilled to be eating like this garbage food. <laughs> and he puts it in the microwave and then... You know, a minute later, like McNabb's knocking on the door again, and he's like, "I smell something burning." And when he says this, um, uh, Nigel like, goes to like kick him out again, and he's like, "Bugger off, you silly giraffe!" <laughs> <laughs> he calls him a giraffe because he's like a foot taller than him. <laughs> he is so much taller. Sage and is I... like six five, I think six six, six four something. Yeah, it, he is so tall. Yeah. it really he stood calls out him in this a giraffe. episode. <laughs> I never, well, you just don't really, until he was standing right next to Tim Curry, it was like, dude, he is so tall. And I have to say that after interviewing him, I love his character even more. I already love the McNabb character. But after interviewing Sage, it was like, I love this character so much. I'm so much more excited to like see him. Because like we have more background information. Like it's like a new thing. Like I'm reanalyzing it. Yeah. Now that we've talked to him and we figured out more about the character and stuff like that. Yeah, I'm definitely like interested in seeing all of his scenes again to like get a, a more of it. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Yeah, that but, was a good um, scene. The uh, Sage was actually right because he looks mm-hmm. over and he knows that people are trying to hurt him. He smells something weird and he, then he looks over and sees that there's like five seconds left on the microwave. He grabs Nigel, pulls him backwards into the hallway, and right when the microwave goes off, an explosion goes off. And he saves probably both of their lives Yeah. Um, by pulling him into the hallway like that. Uh, if they had just kept talking or if he had come into the room, they probably mm-hmm. would both have been have died. So it's a... Yeah. Uh, yeah, it was a very cool scene. Uh, McNabb got you know his moment in the spotlight. Yeah, and uh, that was the fifth attempt now to kill Nigel. 
<laughs> well, they've decided that it's better off now to take Nigel and to take him to a quote unquote safe house. So for them, the safe house is Henry's house. So mm -hmm. they have Nigel <laughs> in Gus's in the, car. In the backseat. In, in the back seat. <laughs> <laughs> this might be one of my favorite things from the show. Um, Nigel, he's in the car. They pull up. They're like at the beach or whatever it, across from Henry's house. And Nigel says, I feel like I've been incarcerated in a blueberry. <laughs> and then as like if I've that wasn't bad enough. In a blueberry. <laughs> as that wasn't, as, wasn't bad enough. He says, this car makes me want to weep and then die. <laughs> And Gus is offended. He's, he doesn't change. He's just like, Sean. <laughs> <laughs> and this brings up, uh, this leads into the next scene when they're, they're similarly connected in this way. Um, uh, they're, they Henry's drop home. him off at Henry's. And Nigel is just mocking everything. He he's mocking everything or being super cynical of everything that happens. The food, the decor, mm. everything. Right. And he comes down wearing Henry's bathrobe. So Henry doesn't notice it right away, but then whenever he comes over to the table to deliver the food, he notices that he's wearing his robe. He didn't ask. It's super impolite. It's his personal robe. But he uh he nonetheless is like serving food. And he's got a bit of an attitude, and Nigel picks up on that, and then they just go at it. It's Henry versus Nigel now, and it's like the battle of wills at this point of who's going yeah. to give in. Yeah. And uh, it brings up thought, the situation. Well, at first I thought when they were, the two of them were doing that, I was thinking, okay, this could go two ways. This could go that this is just how they operate, and they're going to get along great. Or this could go very, very badly because Henry's going to be like, get the hell out of my house. Mm -hmm. Yes, and that that's part of the problem here is that um, we find out that Nigel is not only wearing his robe, but that's all he's wearing. <laughs> he is going he commando said, in the robe. He, he said that the robe was comforting him at an elite level. <laughs> yeah, he's like swaddled in like a cocoon of like cotton or something. Like, yeah, he had a no, really eloquent... He said he said, wait, I have this I have this written because it's one of my favorite things. It says, I feel like an angel baby swaddled in a cocoon of cloud candy. <laughs> <laughs> the eloquence. <laughs> and then you also have to take note the Australian accent as well that adds uh -huh. to it. Yeah. But okay. um yeah, right, so he like this is the line he tells him to get out and he's angry at him and then sean pulls him into the other room and he's like this is a problem everybody who meets him wants to kill him so right. how do i find out who's actually trying to kill him and henry's advice for this one is find out who he victimizes the most he's like that's mm -hmm. easy kid who does he victimize the most and this is where it comes into play where sean has to start thinking again this is our like little henry lesson is yeah. you know, focus on the real victim here, not just the, the 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 dumb ones, the small ones on the side. Right. And I I also want to note here, I looked it up to verify if this was the correct one or not after I finished the episode. But I found in this episode three instances of pineapples. Oh. Two of them I found by accident whenever I paused to like write something down or pause to, to like get a screenshot of something. Mm -hmm. I found two of them by accident. And one of them is here um, on the tape on the counter. Um, you can see it uh, behind Sean and Gus okay. is a pineapple um, next to some other fruits. Hmm. Um, it's like next to a sink. I did not even notice that. Yeah. Found it by, by, yeah. by accident. It was good actually, fun. it was a good one. Yeah. Good, fine. But right. it was at 27 minutes, 46 seconds, if anybody needs to verify. Very cool. Okay. Well, next in the episode, we find out that, uh, well, it shows, actually, uh, Emelina Saffron getting attacked in her bathroom, and she's drugged. So now she's in the ICU. And she is uh, in there for, like, an overdose. Like, when they drugged her, they just did a lot. She 
you know, was was dangerous. So she's right. in so ICU we at saw the hospital. Two people attack mm-hmm. her in the bathroom, mm-hmm. and um, and then, but everybody else looks at it as an OD because they forced it they, into her. Well, but you know, right. it wouldn't be a difficult. That would not be a stretch for her. Right, right, right. So, it was a believable story. Yeah. Um, and they used the similar drugs that she had. Um, I do so, also need to point out two continuity errors real quick. Okay, okay. The first one was at the dinner when Henry came out to put steaks on everybody's plate. Sean already had a steak on his plate, and then he went and put one on, and Sean didn't have a steak on his plate. Oh. So continuity error to there. And then oh. in this scene, where they're fighting, where Emelina's being attacked in the bathroom, mm-hmm. they the guy runs through the walk-in shower, and he pulls the shower curtain off, and it's kind of wrapped around him. And then it shows there's a lot of cuts in this. And one of the cuts, he doesn't, there's no shower curtain. And then in the next cut, it's wrapped around him again. Oh, so, okay. I was too busy errors. laughing in this episode mm-hmm. to notice that. Good calls. Good calls. Uh, um, yeah. So, okay. So she has been, she's, she's in ICU. Sean and Gus decide to go back to <laughs> the, the, the scene. Um, to the bathroom. bathroom. The, the, yeah. Yeah, where she was attacked, mm-hmm. and look around. And are you going Sean... to talk about the hallway? Are you going to talk oh, about the hallway? Or are you skipping yeah, well, the hallway? No, no, no. I got to talk about the hallway. The hallway was fantastic. They were clinging to the hallway backwards as though they were trying to hide. And that's when Gus was like, "Sean, you know we're in a hallway. Everybody can see us." And he's, what did he say? I, I, I don't remember the exact words for uh, for what he said. It was just a funny instance of like they were they were their backs were against the wall. They were moving like slowly up against the wall and whispering to each other as they were going down the hallway. But um and, but but Gus was like, Yeah. He's like, you know we're in a hallway, Sean. You can't hide in a hallway. <laughs> and I then know. and the you scooter. hear this like oh motorized gosh. like wheelchair coming down the hallway. And they get tighter <laughs> against the wall. And then like, they freeze. Like, yeah. They're like they're like statues. And not even breathing. Like after the scooter goes by five minutes later, they're <laughs> they're like, <gasps> and they're breathing heavy, like it was this just horrible thing. So this was the second one that I found by mistake. Um, okay. I, I'm pretty sure. I'm pretty sure. I'm gonna post the pictures for these to for confirmation. But uh, this one, I'm fairly certain that the guy in the wheelchair has you know pineapples on his shirt. Okay. Uh, I feel like I can at least. I feel like I can relatively clearly see two that are, um, like not like in folds or anything that you can clearly see. Okay. So, uh, yeah. Well, we'll, we'll see if everybody okay. else agrees. But yeah. So uh, all right. So while in the bathroom, Sean, they they kind of like uh, cut their losses. They're like, eh, it's whatever. We can't find anything in here. And then he shuts the light off and he sees this little prism on the wall, like a reflection and finds the, in the toilet is what's making the reflection that, that the guy who attacked Emelina um, dropped a, like a charm almost from a necklace, like a little pendant thing from a necklace Mm -hmm. into the toilet. And Sean recognized it and it belonged to none other than Bevan Rennie Llewellyn. He had the yes. same necklace on whenever they were talking to him at the, the studio. Yeah. So Sean like figured out, okay, that kid's got something to do with it. And maybe his very first instinct was right. Yeah. Um, yeah, yeah. He calls Juliet. He gets Juliet to stick her hand in the toilet to get it. And mm-hmm. then, um, and he, he didn't technically <laughs> see what it was until Juliet took it out and was like holding it. Then that's when it clicked for him. That it was that guy's because yeah, to be that's fair, when Gus goes back to the psych office to investigate and like do some good uh-huh. on the guy, and then Sean goes with Juliet. And to be fair, um, he did tell her to bring gloves. Yeah, yeah, yeah. He did. No, he did. I mean, he was kind about it. Mm-hmm. Um, so we go to the hospital, and Lassiter. Like, were you as surprised as I was that Lassie was sitting next to? Emelina's yeah. bed, like so worried, and like later in the scene, he calls her baby, and like I, I mean, like he developed this very weird attachment mm-hmm. to her. Like, yeah, it he, very it, odd. It, he judged her, and uh, he he's like he, he he realizes now that he made the wrong call. That he was too hard on her, and that she just needed help. And he it felt bad. It struck a chord yeah. for him. Wow, Did, are I you mean, telling me that you missed 
the third pineapple in this no, episode? No, the third pineapple was at 33 minutes, 45 seconds when Sean enters the room. Okay. I was okay. talking about right. Lassie first. Okay. I thought we were just in the room already. No, no, okay. no. Sean enters the room 33 like, minutes, 45 seconds. Pineapple? Okay. Right. And right. he brings a pineapple with a bow to okay. her room right. as, as a gift. It, you know? Oh, I got it. Mm-hmm. And then I might have missed the other two hidden ones, but I got this one. Okay. Um, and so anyway, while they're there in the room, she wakes up, slaps Lassie, and does this little thing with her hands, with, her, with the eyes, look at me. She says, look at me. And she, go, she like goes back out. Well, that's when Sean has that moment of like, Okay, I know what happened. So then he goes out into the hallway and calls Gus, and Gus tells him what he found out, and that is sort of like bringing the whole thing together. Right, and what Gus found out was that Bevan Rennie Llewellyn was a super fan of Zapato, and that there was pictures of him when he was a child with Zapato, and like they knew each other, and they were really big fans, or that he was a big fan of his. Mm -hmm. And then he tells Gus, he's like, Emelina just told me, look at me. And he's like, what does that have to do with us? And he's like, look at me. The same way that Zapato mm-hmm. says it. And Gus is like, oh, okay, that's it. So they yeah. know that those two are in on it together. And mm-hmm. they just needed to, they, they, I, don't, I don't, at this point, I don't know if they figured out why. I think they just know that it, that it is. Right. And then the next scene has them at the studio um, coming out on stage where everybody is for the wrap up. And that's when Gus says what he does. He's like, you're in the presence of a homicidal sociopath. Have you noticed, is it just me? Like you've noticed over the all of season one. And now that Gus really wants to be a part of these wrap ups. Yes, he does. He's, he's having trouble stopping himself from, from helping Sean. Like jumping into the spotlight the a little bit. <laughs> Yeah. Well, because he comes out on stage and he's got the full like Superman pose, and he's like, "Yeah, we thought you all should know that you're in the presence of a homicidal sociopath." <laughs> and they just so happen to be jumping on stage while Chance and Rance are on oh. stage doing their little sing along, and Chance is like, he, his look on his face is he's a little freaked out. He's like, "Oh no, 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 no! He's not crazy. We had him tell right. like we got a doctor's note, <laughs> thinking that he's so talking like- about Rance." <laughs> obvious that rance is messed up like something's <laughs> wrong with rance but uh wow. but then uh they they go into the wrap-up uh would you like me to do the wrap-up i would love that go for it all right so the guys storm the stage and we find out that zabato and his biggest fan have teamed up to kill nigel uh the show and we kind of got a little piece of this with Lasseter's interrogation and then he also kind of got angry at Zabato here because Zabato was kind of like, you know, crapping on him again, telling mm-hmm. him like, if I, he can't even speak. He can't think. He can't be the one who tried to kill me. And then, you know, Zabato kind of lost it. And the situation was that he was the first person to sign on to the show. Zabato, this was for him, this was supposed to be his comeback. This was supposed to be his, his moment in the spotlight. And it just didn't work out. Nigel takes the spotlight. And he's the one that people mm-hmm. are like look up to and try to impress all the time. And he's the one that people listen to. And that really frustrated Zapato. So he got with his super fan friend. Um, he got him to like essentially come to every one and do bad auditions so that he could keep following him around to every city. And they worked together to try and kill him. And then Zapato admitted it. And when he did, Nigel actually thought it was really funny because he's like, you were five feet away from me all of the time. You're the worst murderer I've ever seen. He like judges <laughs> his efforts of trying to murder him. He critiqued him, yeah. <laughs> and then he started singing this song like Mirame, like like as like just like to mock him further. Mm-hmm. <laughs> but yeah, that was that that's I uh, how that episode wrapped up. There's one last scene in this episode. Um, it's right after the 40 minute mark, and it is pure gold. Oh this my gosh. This is the, they're essentially their, um, their second chance at glory. Yes. For the talent show. They have, they have recreated their looks perfectly from mm-hmm. when they were kids, and they're going to yep. give it another shot. They're on stage singing shout. They're in full costume. 
Um, uh, Sean is Roland Orzabal, and uh, Gus is Michael Jackson. Full costume, hair, like the wigs, the hair extensions, all of it. They look great. There's look smoke so on the stage, and <laughs> like it starts out with Gus, it. with Sean, and he's got the he's yeah he's got the rhythm. He's singing well. He's doing hand movements, yeah. and then Gus comes in out of nowhere and jumping on stage as Michael Jackson, and he's doing all the moves. He's doing the moonwalk. He's doing like the the hand tuck. He's doing that stance, like the pose. He throws the microphone at one point. In- like, instead of saying "come on," he says "shaman," like Michael Jackson does. It mm-hmm. was it was so perfect. Shemal. So good. So good. <laughs> it was so good. And it, it seemed like one of those moments where the actors were having so much fun to do oh, this. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, absolutely. Re- oh, this was such a good episode. Oh, but after they after they perform, poor things, they get judged by Nigel St. Nigel. Uh-huh. Yeah, and he is like it's oh, it's, it's brutal. built up for him for having to pass them through this far. Yeah, he's, it, yeah, it was brutal. Let's just say it was brutal. Yeah, he, he tells them to euthanize themselves. Yeah, like it was really, it was really, really brutal. My favorite part of it though is after that brutal, brutal judgment, they turn around to walk away, and Sean just cannot get past. The disdain, like, and he keeps like looking, looking around his shoulder, like at Nigel, just like, wow, like, like that hurt, man. Like you can, <laughs> it was bad, it was bad, but that was such a good episode. I love that episode. Mm-hmm. Love yeah, it. No, it was, it was so good, especially the ending. I'm so happy they did that. That was such an awesome way. It was so funny, and the energy mm-hmm. was so good. The the beginning and the end bookended that episode exactly. beautifully. It was mm-hmm. beautiful. And it, it's sort of like, because the first time in the beginning, it didn't actually show you them performing anything. Mm-hmm. So all you got to see was them, like, they're dressed up. They walk out onto the stage. You don't know what they've done. And so now at the end, you got to see, like, the, oh, it was good. It was good. Yeah. yeah. All um, right. So, Barb, that's yeah. the episode. Let's get your pineapple rating. Oh, I'm going five. General thoughts on the episode. So, yeah. like, to, I mean, we kind of just talked about it a little bit, yeah, but I don't know. What's your general thoughts? Pineapples. Five pineapples. It had everything. It had everything. And it was so, like, on point comedically, like, so, so, so funny the whole episode through. This wasn't one of those scenes where you just had one super funny episode and it was, or one super funny scene and the rest of it was just okay and solving the mystery. Right. This it was, was like funny after funny after funny after funny. And you still got the other stuff too because the mystery of it was still good. Yeah. So, yeah. So, really, yeah, I, on all count, yeah, five. It's five starting off strong. I- I am also yeah. going to give out my first five pineapple reviews. What? American Duos episode one starts out with five pineapples for me Woo-hoo! for season two. I loved it. I, I, I just loved everything about it. The flashback, we got our new young Gus, which we love. Yeah. It was really funny with them. It was really funny at the end with their older selves doing it. Lots of really funny scenes in the middle. I, I really enjoyed all of it. We got to have all of the characters in it. Plus, yes. we got the introduction of the blueberry. Yes! We've got the we've got a couple like nicknames for Lassiter. We got a uh-huh. nickname for Gus. This was just packed. There was so much to like write about and talk about in this yeah. episode. So it, it perfect. It was so good. Not even a question. Five no. pineapples all day. Yeah. And please, please let us know. We're so excited to start out season two with our pineapple rating system. Mm-hmm. We're going to be posting them on Reddit, on Facebook group. Um, please try and get in there and leave a review and leave any thoughts or anything like that that you want to you want to share with people. Let the psychos know how you feel about these. If we can get have like a cool little rating, uh, like a full on rating system going. Yeah, definitely. And we can post it. You know, like yeah. okay, this yeah, week keep a spreadsheet and we can keep track of it. And when the season's over, we'll post a legitimate you know spreadsheet. Yeah, that yeah, that would be fun. So definitely vote, even if you don't have time to comment, vote. Mm-hmm. So, all right, Matt, what was your ah, uh, yeah, moment? My ah, uh, yeah, moment? I mean, this is really difficult for this episode just because there's, there's several. Okay. I think my strongest one, though, I mean, so I'm going between, like, uh, McNabb saving uh, Nigel. That could have been an all yeah moment. Oh yeah. There's the scene where I mean 
I, I think I have to go with at the end the final music, like the, okay. the, the 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 talent show part. Okay, that was just so good. It was so funny. Everything was on point. Their their singing, their movements, the dancing. Mm-hmm. Like Gus killed it with yeah. all of the like um, the the Michael the Jackson, Michael Jackson moves. dances and moves. So that one was mine, definitely. Okay, mine was when Jules was teaching them how to dance. Yeah, you really love that one. You like that one more than I do. There were so many elements in that. Like, there was the sarcasm. There was the Jules being, like, over the top, serious. And, like, you got to really see her competitive side sort of come out there. Mm -hmm. Um, And I I don't know. There were were a a lot of things about that scene that were just so good. So... Yeah. Um, did you have a come on, son? I did not have one in this episode. I didn't. Really? Yeah. It might. It Don't really. Go commando truly... in another man's rope. Okay. <laughs> That's com- come on, son. Okay, I get that. That was a good I one. I said that one in scene, like in the scene. <laughs> <laughs> that was a good one. I like that. Okay. Um. Okay. So, what about a wait for it moment? I had a little tiny wait for it moment to see. Okay when like what was going on with Lassiter and Emelina like I don't know that got weird for a second okay it got (laughs) Um, weird for a big old second yeah yeah yeah. so I I don't know if something was gonna come from that where we were gonna see her again but um for for a little bit there that that would probably be my my wait for it just see what happens with that my wait for it was actually at the end when they performed the show like you see him standing there and it was like oh wait for it it's gonna be good (laughs) You know, like I, yeah, that was my way for it. Um, I, you kind of talked about Henry's lessons. What did yeah, you? Yeah, I highlighted it in an yeah. episode. Um, uh, like who does he victimize the most? You know, like, you know, look closer. If you have lots of options, like who's the most likely? List? Who who is the most to gain from doing this? Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Um, let's see, eighties guest stars and references. I know we talked right. about a lot of them. Do you have like a I list? I want you. Oh, I do. I want you to get comfortable, Matt. There were a lot in this episode, so here we go. Oh. All right, we start off with Tim Curry, who played Nigel St. Nigel in this episode. He has 236 acting credits that start back in 1968. Very, very famous for the Rocky Horror Picture Show. A lot of success in the 80s through hits like Clue. He was in the movie Clue. Uh, He was in Wise Guys TV series. And maybe one of his most famous roles in the 80s was in 1982. He played the role of Rooster in the movie Annie. That was originally a Broadway play. Huge, huge, huge hit. So that was big for him. Gina Gershon, who played Emelina Saffron, um, also started her career in 1981. She was a dancer, but you would see her in Pretty in Pink and Cocktail and several videos like Cindy Lauper's Girls Just Want to Have Fun and The Cars Hello Again. She also was in some great 90s movies like Showgirls and Face Off with John Travolta and Nicolas Cage. So she's still a very busy actress. She's in a lot of stuff. Uh, Let's talk now about Tears for Fears. This was a band that formed in 1981. Roland Orzabal and Kurt Smith later appeared on the show. Kurt Smith later appeared on the show. Um, They had hits in the 80s, uh, starting with Mad World in 1982. And Shout, which you heard in this episode. Everybody Wants to Rule the World, Head Over Heels. All the songs from Songs from the Big Chair album were out between like 1984 and 1986, and they were their biggest hits. But they also performed in the Live Aid concert in 1985, which was a big deal at the time. I know you were not, you know, born yet, Matt, but... I've seen the... uh... The... <sighs> yeah, Live Aid, like Queen performed at it. Yeah, like, I it saw was... the Queen. It was Which huge. Mean, it was maybe. very huge. And, you know, just as an added bonus like here, him. you, your mom and I lived down the street from there and we could hear it from our house. Like this concert was, it was huge. So um, it was in Philadelphia and they performed at that. Michael Jackson, we all know. I don't really think I need to recap much about Michael Jackson. Mm-hmm. Um, Crump. I looked up the word because Juliet tells them, I can teach you how to crump. And I was like, where did that come from? So it is from 1990, actually. It is a style of street dance popularized in the United States, described as Afro-diasporic dance, characterized by free, expressive, exaggerated, and highly energetic movement. Dancers who started crumping saw the dance as a means for them to escape gang life 
and to express raw emotions in a powerful but nonviolent way. Interesting. Okay. There was meaning. Um, okay, so in one of the scenes, Sean says, for the love of Lori Loughlin, Lori Loughlin played Aunt Becky on Full House in the 80s sitcom and was just in the news recently for a big college scandal. So um, they couldn't have foreseen that. She I, I, is also in another episode. Um, I think it's like yes. Nip. Like yeah, nip, she plays a plastic like surgeon. Socket or something. No. Uh-huh. Yes. Yep. Um, so then there was Take On Me. This was Sean and Gus's audition song. This was performed originally by a band called Aha and was a huge hit in 1984. They were sort of like a one-hit wonder sort of band. Aha. That was like their biggest thing. Aha. <laughs> the video for that that song was pretty incredible, though. It was like very artistic. Like they were drawn like a sketch and then they went through like the – paper and came out as real people it was a really cool video everyone talked about it a lot at the time um okay david lee roth and yankee rose which was supposed to be their second audition song was on david lee roth's first solo project released in 1986 by the ex-lead singer for van halen david lee roth was the first singer for the band van halen uh, then we jump ahead a little bit to the next reference, which was to Rain Man. Rain Man was a 1988 hit movie starring Tom Cruise and Dustin Hoffman. We also, in that same scene, talk about Prince. Prince was a legendary musician. Hits like Purple Rain. Also, the movie Purple Rain in 1984. They reference Little Red Corvette, which was a hit in 1983. And Under the Cherry Moon was a movie released in 1986. Uh, another reference was Tony Randall. He was a great actor. Career began in the 40s. He was in the Odd Couple TV series with Jack Klugman. And then from 1981 to 1983, he was in a sitcom called Love, Sydney. He also did Disney movies and Broadway. Uh, next reference is Holland Oates. Holland Oates is a duo that formed in philadelphia in 1970 they are still performing today uh they have they're actually starting a tour in this month as a matter of fact he or they had huge huge 80s hits with man eater in 1982 out of touch in 1984 and many more like method of modern love sarah smiles and say it isn't so Chris Christopherson is also referenced in this episode. This singer and actor was in the group The Highwaymen in 1985 with Willie Nelson, Waylon Jennings, and Johnny Cash. He had many of his own hits as well. He is still living, and just for you, Matt, he was also in the Blade trilogy from 1998 to 2004 is when those movies came out. Uh, they also reference Geraldo. And this is Zapato references Geraldo. Geraldo was a talk show host and had a a talk show in the 80s. He's still kind of like a news commentator kind of guy. But um, his talk show ran from 1988 to 1990. And they referenced Ricky Martin as well. Ricky Martin was a member of Menudo. This was a Latin boy band. They sold millions and millions and millions of records. Uh, they um, He was in that band from 1983 to 1990 and then went on to have a solo career with hits like Live in La Vida Loca. And that I think is plenty of '80s references. <laughs> yeah, that that was that's insane. I mean, they packed all that into one episode. I know, that was a and forty-five minute I, episode. <laughs> I bet that I might. I mean, I could have missed some, but I think now, I was being pretty thorough. You gave dates for all those, I believe. Uh -huh. so yes, I did. If any of some of them were '90s stuff, but most of them were '80s stuff, so I think that yeah. we're covered. I think we're covered. Yeah. Okay. Yeah, I, the one the one thing I did not actually put on the list was Bay City Rollers. Mm -hmm. um, that was where Nigel got the cigarette case was from one of the Bay City Rollers. And when I looked it up, they're like 70s. So I just didn't go there. Oh, okay. All right. All right. I see. Yeah. Whew. Okay. All right. Well, I've got a similar situation for the next one. Our favorite quotes. Oh, I gave okay. a bunch of them in here. I'll, I'll recap a few of the ones we found. Okay. I feel like I've been incarcerated in a blueberry. Yes. Rule number one, Sean, no talking during duos. I like that one. Okay. Don't be a rabid porcupine. Uh, I don't remember the person to whom you're referring, but she was hideous. <laughs> a curious cocktail of inbreeding and type 2 diabetes. I like that one. That one's good. 
Probably my favorite was, I'm going to crack her like a bad back. <laughs> that was my favorite quote from Lassiter. Um, I also have one more, bugger off, you silly giraffe, was what <laughs> Nigel said to McNabb. So those were all my favorite quotes from this episode. I, I did not have a list that long. Mine are, I can teach you how to crump. Mm-hmm. Maybe. That's up to you. That's that was Jules, and then I had two by Nigel. One was I feel like I've been incarcerated in a blueberry, but there was also the I feel like an angel baby swaddled in a cocoon of cloud candy. <laughs> that was that. Those good were one. my three favorites. Good that one. was a good one. So, um, Nick, we did talk a little bit about the nicknames for Gus. We had silly nicknames: Sean Spenstar and Gus TT Showbiz. Yep. Awesome. Mm-hmm. I how did did you have anything that you would go back and make different about this episode? Does it hold up for you? It holds up fantastic. This episode yeah. was great. I loved every bit of it. Like even after even though American Idol I think actually just got announced that it was ending if I recall. But even though American Idol is really old now, I still love it. I yeah. still think it's great that the like the the references they made and all that stuff mm-hmm. it all still works. Uh, I mean, I never even watched the show. I, I just know what it is. So I think well, the that, beauty of it is that it did run long enough, and they did have people that went on to have such great careers that people know what it is, even if they didn't watch it. Yeah, so, you know. Yeah, I, I mean, think it holds up great. I, yeah, yeah, yeah I agree. But Ooh, well, yeah, this a... one was definitely a long one. I think just because of how dense the yeah. episode was, with awesome stuff to talk about. So yeah. Well, on our next episode, we will be discussing Season 2, Episode 2, 65 Million Years Off. Yeah, don't forget to check us out on our Facebook group, We Know You Know, dot, 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 a podcast about psych. Uh, there's going to be links down in the description. That's where we're going to post um, a lot of our like uh, announcements for when new episodes are coming out, as well as the rating for the, the pineapple rating system. So if you do want to get in on that and let your voice be known, check it out. And uh, leave a leave a comment. Check a box in the poll. You can also catch us on our Instagram, which is the Psych Podcast. Um, you can email in if that's what you'd prefer for a private message. Um, it's uh, the Psych Podcast at gmail dot com. And you can find us now on Reddit at the Psych Podcast. Yep, just search us up on there. Um, and also another shout out to the Reddit forum. The subreddit there is uh, just Psych. So. Check it out there. Lots of people. They post lots of cool stuff, too. Very similar to the Psych Fanatics of Facebook. So definitely love all of these psych groups. The psychos are great. We love you guys. Absolutely. Thanks for joining us. I hope you guys have a great week. And we hope you're looking forward to the rest of season two. We know we are. (laughs) Bye.